don't need any more than Phoebe's talk. That was incredible. And I appreciate she's left me. <laughs> <laughs> Is this the tip for the evening? <laughs> what a tremendous privilege to be here. As Phoebe said, I, my family has a rather different drink. And I confess that the first time I came to Gainesville, I'd never heard of Gatorade, although one of my good friends at Oxford was one of your former quarterbacks for the Gators. But it was a privilege to meet your husband, Mary. And the next time, I understood what Gatorade was. So it's a tremendous privilege for me to be here. Here we are in this museum, which is the fruit of the creative genius of Dr. Cade and the generosity of the family. And I'm deeply aware tonight that as a visitor to this country and a longtime admirer of this country, I am equally a beneficiary of this extraordinary republic. As many of you know, America has often been described as the first new nation for the reason that it's a nation by intention and by ideas and was invented at a certain stage in history. Historians would actually say today that it's the second new nation because the Jewish people were founded as the first new nation very simply, as we see in the book of Exodus, and their story is actually a very key part to the founding of this country. But more of that later. Let me begin with two incidents from the early days of the Republic. In 1843, when the last of the veterans of the Revolutionary War were very old, a Harvard researcher was going around meeting as many as he could. And he met Captain Levi Preston, a 91-year-old veteran of Lexington and Concord. The old gentleman was very stooped, raised himself up to his full height, and the question is, well, why did you go out to fight? And he was so startled at any question so obvious, he didn't answer. And the student said, well, were you oppressed? No, he growled, we weren't oppressed. What about the Stamp Act, he said? Never paid a penny. <coughs> what about the tea tax? Never drank a drop of tea, he said. The boys threw the stuff in the harbor before we got there. <laughs> Well, surely you've read books like Burke and Locke and Sidney and Harrington. Never heard of most of them, he said. We only had two books, the Bible, or three rather, Isaac Watts Hymnal and A Farmer's Almanac. <laughs> anyway, the discussion and the interview was going on rather fruitlessly, and eventually the young man asked the question again, why did you go out to fight? And the old boy gave this immortal answer. We had always been free, and we intended to be free always. And the Redcoats didn't mean that we should. Now, he put in a graphically simple way what is the heart of the daring of the American Republic. The idea not just of a free society, but a free society that could stay free forever. Never been done in history. How did they try to do it? The other instance, the famous time when after a hard day's work in the office at Albany, a young lawyer got into his father-in-law's sloop and sailed down the Hudson. Instead of relaxing after the day, he wrote furiously and many, many hours later, when the boat reached Manhattan, the printer's agent met him, and what he'd written was rushed off, and the next morning came out as what we know as the first Federalist paper, Alexander Hamilton, written in a very sober prose, not in rap or hip hop. <laughs> <laughs> but think what they were doing. Niccolo Machiavelli had said, it is impossible to order a perpetual republic. Freedom never lasts. 
among other things, freedom is the greatest enemy of freedom and always undermines itself. And yet they tried to create a free republic that could stay free. As Alexander Hamilton wrote in that first Federalist, the question before us is whether societies of men are capable or not of establishing good governments from reflection and choice. Thinking about it, figuring it out creatively and invent inventively, and creating a free republic. Thomas Jefferson wasn't there, he was in Paris, so he would have been asked to contribute too. But he said those papers were the best commentary on the principles of government ever written. They were, of course, were in favor of the Constitution itself. Our British Prime Minister, William Gladstone, he said, the US Constitution is the most wonderful work ever struck off at a given time by the brain and purpose of man. More recently, Paul Johnson, a historian today, says the creation of the United States is the greatest of human adventures, a human achievement without any parallel. Reflection and choice. Everyone knew the perpetual motion machine didn't work. Always the second law of thermodynamics undermined it and they ran down. And yet your framers dared to believe that while Machiavelli and many others said it was impossible to create a free society that could stay free, they believed they'd figure out a system and you see the Federalist Papers, all the genius of the checks and balances and the inventiveness, they believed they could do it. Jewish rabbis often say, the creation of the universe is described in 34 verses. For the master of the universe, it was nothing. But the creation of a society that reflected freedom and justice takes in the Torah 59 chapters. Because we're not just dealing with inanimate nature, we're dealing with human nature and all that that means for the difficulties of creating a free society that is just and does real service to human dignity. Now, of course, there are many things about what the framers did that are relatively obvious to see and to describe. And let me just mention them rather quickly. For them, it was clear that there were three tasks in establishing a free society. Winning freedom, that's the revolution. But of course, many societies have done that. The French did it, the Russians did it, the Chinese did it. Many countries have thrown off an ancien regime and replaced it with another one. Winning freedom isn't that original. The second part, though, was ordering freedom. And that's much different and much harder. And the French didn't do it. The Russians and the Chinese didn't do it, and their revolutions spiraled down to demonic disorder, worse than the regimes they replaced. Ordering freedom is a much greater challenge, moral, political, constitutional, and that, of course, is not the revolution, but the US Constitution. But the framers knew that the really hard part was the third part, winning freedom, ordering freedom, sustaining freedom. Ben Franklin again, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. And they talked a lot about the perpetuation of our institutions. They had an incredible sense of time. You can see the young Abraham Lincoln, 28 years old, talks about the silent artillery of time assaulting the republic and so on, 50 years after the revolution itself. But those are relatively easy to describe, but of course, the first one is the one everyone <clears throat> celebrates, the most obvious and the most glorious, but in many ways the easiest. And the third one, which is the hardest, 
because it's not the work of a year or two or a decade or two or even a century or two. It's the work of the running centuries. It's our job today. That, of course, is by far the hardest, sustaining freedom, but it's one that hardly anyone talks about now. In my 30 odd years in Washington, DC, I've only heard one person and one book address that topic of sustaining and preserving freedom, which of course is the challenge of this generation. The second thing that's relatively obvious is the framers understanding of the challenges to freedom, the menaces freedom faced. And what's striking about your framers is they were not just revolutionary, they were rooted. They knew their history. They ransacked the classics. Plato, Aristotle, Cicero, Polybius, to look at every system that had gone before them to see where it was strong, where it was weak, why it had failed, and how they must do something that did not fail as all the previous systems had failed. And they knew well that there were three broad classical menaces. The first, the challenge of external forces. They didn't take that terribly seriously, or it's a big one in the classics. A nation can suddenly find itself with people better armed, better trained, greater whatever, and they're in trouble. That wasn't a concern for the framers, because the nearest real threats were 3,000 miles away, and you have the world's two greatest oceans as your natural buffers. But of course, today, that is a challenge. And we see what's called today the Thucydides trap. We have a ruling power challenged by a rising power. In Thucydides' time, that was Sparta and Athens. And today, of course, it's America challenged by the res restored power of China. But that wasn't the framers' concern. The second challenge did come much closer. What the classical writers called the corruption of customs. We're thinking about, because Polybius argues, among others, that what defines a nation is its constitution. You read that single sentence, Americans just, well, haven't we got the best? So what more do we need? But Polybius goes on. And he says, the best constitution in the world rests on a bedding of customs, traditions, moral standards, ideals, beliefs. And if there's a corruption and erosion of those customs, the best constitution in the world will not hold things together. And the greatest challenges to such a constitution will always be in times of power and prosperity. But for the classical writers, the third challenge was the hardest, which in one word was time. Time. Time passes. Passing of time, the presence of sin, nothing stays the same. We all know the poem of Shelley on Ozymandias, which is his poem about Ramesses II, the greatest of all the Egyptian pharaohs. And you can see the Egyptian and others try to overcome time through monumentalism. And of course, we have their pyramids, and they've long gone, and the civilization they founded has long gone, and all we have left is the pile of stones. And the framers tried to build something that wasn't built on monumentalism, but ideas, such as human dignity and human freedom and justice and so on. But the question is, how's that doing against the challenges of time? Many of you will have read at college uh, Edward Gibbon, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. His book was published, the last volume, the same year as the US Constitution, 1787. And in his last chapter, Gibbon says, why did Rome fall? He says, I had the idea for the book when I was in Rome and saw grass growing and cattle grazing where the senators and the, Rome, uh, the, 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 the emperors deliberated. Time. Capitol Hill, named after Rome. The Senate, named after the Roman senators. 
But what's amazing, if you stand in Rome, you can see 1,500 years of civilization just in the monuments. And you're only too aware of the passing of time. But there's barely a word in the monuments of Washington that gives you any sense of the passing of time and the challenge that it represents. Those things are relatively easy to say. The framers were deeply aware of what they were doing in those sorts of ways. But today, in my experience, both reading and listening to many people, especially in Washington and many universities, there is a key element to what they did that's very often overlooked. Ask most Americans where, say, freedom come from. They talk about democracy coming from Athens. Not so. The framers were very wary of democracy. Actually, the American Republic comes not from Athens, but from Mount Sinai. And it was what they understood of the Hebrew experiment in freedom and justice that actually shaped so much of the American experiment. Many of the centuries of the Christian church had actually been shaped on Roman structures. Roman structures are hierarchical. But the Reformation rediscovered the Bible and the printing press, as we saw outside, and they rediscovered the Bible and the Old Testament, including the political template of the Exodus and the Torah. And you can see that Calvin, Zwingli, Knox, Cromwell, Cromwell called it the direct parallel to what they were trying to do in the English Revolution. But of course, the English Revolution failed. It's called the lost cause. But what was the lost cause in England became the winning cause in New England. And the Mayflower Compact was a covenant based on Exodus. John Winthrop's sermon on the Arbella was based on a covenant. And the New England churches brought that covenantalism into New England, into churches, marriages, townships, and eventually the Constitution. As John Adams says, the Constitution of Massachusetts is a covenant. And of course, in the 18th century, it became the US Constitution, which is a form of covenant. And you can see so many things that come directly from the Old Testament in ways that many Americans don't realize today. They don't go back to Athens. They go back to the Torah. For example, just to take the three main ones. The fact that in the Old Testament you have freely chosen consent. Three times it says when God offers them the covenant, all that the Lord says, we will do. They sign on. The whole people sign on. It's what Princeton Scholar calls an almost democracy. Freely chosen consent. It's the origin of the consent of the government. Or again, you have in the Torah a voluntary binding commitment. The covenant is not a contract. A contract is legal and narrow and deals with certain narrow interests where a covenant is much more comprehensive and has that moral dimension of a lifetime pledge. Of course, that's behind the Pledge of Allegiance and so on. But it was the third feature of the Torah and its covenant which was so powerful in New England, which was the reciprocal responsibility of everyone for everyone. As the Jews put it, every Jew responsible for every Jew. As the three musketeers put it later, all for one and one for all. And that, of course, is the origin of famous things at the heart of it, like you love your neighbor as yourself. And you look at New England, there was a sense of the commonwealth, the common good. There was a reciprocity about it, a solidarity about it. The fundamental authority was a collective responsibility. And of course, that underlines a whole notion of we, the people. Now, you read the Torah, it's all addressed to you. You might say, you, the people. 
but they're addressed as a whole, not just as individuals. And you can see how so much of that coming from Mount Sinai was for the early Americans the direct inspiration of what became <coughs> nationalized somewhat, secularized somewhat, and eventually the US Constitution. Now, of course, that raises the question, if that's where things were, where are we today? The great experiment. Freedom, scientific experiments are open-ended. Freedom can always go one way or another way. The heart of freedom is it can go towards good or it can go towards ill, and so on. And we also have to ask, where is it now? As an outsider, I'm always struck that the State of the Union address very rarely addresses the real State of the Union. <laughs> but in many ways today, you need to raise the question, what is the state of the great American experiment in freedom? It's no secret that America today is as divided now as at any time since just before the Civil War. But the question is why? Some people say just another episode in the ongoing 50 years of culture war. Some people say, well, it's just another example of the coastals, California, New York, over against the heartlanders, the flyover territory in the Midwest, and so on. More recently, people are saying, well, it's an example of the nationalists and the populists, and we have examples in other countries, Europe and so on, against George Soros-type globalists. And I think there's some element of truth in all of those. But I would be one of those who would say that if you look at the divisions today, the deepest division of all is between those who understand the republic and above all freedom in the light of 1776 and the American Revolution and those who understand the republic and freedom in the light, and often they're hardly aware of it, of ideas that are actually rooted in the French Enlightenment and the French Revolution. And if you're looking today, currently it's the rage for socialism. But since the 60s, political correctness, identity politics, tribal <laughs> politics, social constructionism, the sexual revolution, these things don't go back to 1776 and its roots. In each case, they go back to 1789 and extremely different roots. And of course, they will come out differently because their views of the republic, their views of freedom, are decisively different. Now, of course, the way you build a nation will also be decisive in the way a nation breaks down if it does. And you can see even in the scriptures themselves, let alone in history, examples of how covenantal constitutional republics decline. You can see it's not long in scripture from the covenant and all that that meant for human dignity and freedom to the famous verse at the end of the judges, there was no king in Israel and people did what was right in their own eyes. And we know what followed from that. They were soon clamoring for a king and they're warned that the central authority will lead towards power, corruption and oppression. And we know that while King David and King Solomon were glorious. King Solomon ended up, as the Jews put it, as a second Pharaoh. And you had Israel almost as a second Egypt with half the country, virtually servants to build his palaces and his temple. In other words, as Thomas Hobbes put it like this, there is a natural impulse when covenantalism falls apart, you have the rise of three toxic elements. Individualism in a rampant degenerative form, relativism, everyone doing what they think right. Individualism, inequalities, and injustices. 
And when that happens, you have a clamoring for a power to protect ordinary people. And eventually, that power setting out to protect becomes some new form of Leviathan, and eventually, in its turn, powerful, oppressive, and corrupt. And the cycle goes on. So make no mistake, there are many forces at work in this country which are very different from 1776 and the American Revolution and its great experiment in freedom. And if some of these ideas prevail, they quite clearly put an end to the American Revolution as the experiment the founders set up. In other words, put it in Roman terms, we are today at a Rubicon moment. You remember in 49 BC, Julius Caesar, who had been the general in Gaul, was at the edge of the river Rubicon. The Rubicon was the boundary between the provinces and Rome itself. And if he crossed the river, he was marching on Rome with his 13th legion and instigating civil war. Caesar paused, hesitated for a long while, and eventually crossed the Rubicon. And as we know, that was the death of the Republic of Cicero and others and the beginning of the civil war that led to imperial Rome. History never repeats like that. But you can see if you look at the ideas that are now in America, either there needs to be a restoration of the American experiment as the founders set up with the blind spots and the evils and the contradictions and the hypocrisies addressed, <coughs> supremely slavery, or there will be a repealing and a replacing of the American Revolution. So I suggest to you soberly, as an admirer of this country and a profound admirer of your founding fathers, you are in a generation that truly is at a Rubicon moment for the future of freedom. Anyone who looks at history, you know well that this experiment in freedom is rare. America is the longest running public tutorial in the art of political freedom. Athenian democracy lasted no more than 50 years. So were this to fail, and we can see the forms of authoritarianism all around today's world, it would be a tragedy of historic circumstances. And yet there's no need for it. It would be a fall that's profoundly unnecessary. And so this is a time for citizens to appreciate what the framers were doing with their creativity and their inventiveness and how rare and how fragile and yet how daring and courageous it was to believe that you could create a free society that could stay free forever. Do you believe that? Now is the time for citizens to understand it and to enter into public debate and truly to stand for it. I often say in Washington, I had the privilege of speaking in the Senate twice last year, the difference between 1861, when America was equally deeply divided, and you remember Lincoln saying, a house divided against itself cannot stand. But in 1861, there was a Lincoln. And he addressed and knew how to address the evils of the slavery in the light of what he called the better angels of the American nature. And that's the missing thing today. Hardly anyone's addressing the better angels. 
people talking about making America great again without asking what really made it great in the first place. But that, I think, is where we can each start. Alexei de Tocqueville, a far, far greater commentator than I am, the greatest of all the foreign commentators on this country. You remember, only here nine months, and his two tremendous half, his book, Democracy in America, he knew the French Revolution, he knew the American Revolution. He wasn't an uncritical admirer. He saw many of the flaws we now see working out today. But he was a disappointed lover in his own country's revolution. And towards the end of his life, after a lifetime of comparing the French and the American, and strongly championing the American, as I would, he made this little remark. With a revolution, as with a novel, shifting from scientific experiments to literate ones, with a revolution, as with a novel, the hard part to invent is the ending. We're at a very crucial chapter, if not page. And may our voices and our stands today make a difference in this great experiment in freedom. Thank you.